did you ever uh, did you get a new beer? I did, yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, in that <laughs> case, Matt's got a beer, and I don't have any beers in the house, but I did find this bottle of wine. So let me pour this <laughs> while we get started. What's it called? Does it have a Does it have a good name? I only buy wine with good names. It's a California cab called Dark Horse. I've never tried it. Okay. Hello, dearies. Welcome to Undersampled Radio, episode 63. What's that, Matt? That is the 64th episode. That's two to the power of six. So that's pretty exciting. Bit of a milestone. <laughs> um, we, we have a bit of a hack together situation today. Um, I was running late. Matt's in a pile of Legos. And I'm actually sitting in a box. I still haven't unpacked yet. So uh it's gonna be a good one um i'm gonna jump straight into it matt because the last thing i did before i got stuck in an hour's worth of traffic to get to this episode was accidentally ping the google maps api seven million i attempted to hit it seven million times <laughs> which if you know anything about the google maps api actually charges you and i didn't calculate what the expense would have been but it would have been hefty <laughs> So, fortunately, that didn't uh, didn't work. So I didn't have to pay for seven million sets of directions between schools in Chicago. <laughs> so you tried to you you tried to make these API calls, but they didn't actually work. Yeah, um, that's, right. That's so lucky. it's like you have to turn on um, charging per you know over a certain amount of uh, yeah things to server, and okay. it didn't happen. So that's good. Um, building a I'm doing all these graph machine learning little toys right now, and uh, one of them is a graph convolutional network, and I need a lot of map direction data for this one demo I'm building. So anyway, that's all that's happening with me. What is happening with Agile? Um, we're, uh, we're sort of in proposal heaven, hell. <laughs> I'm not sure. I just seem to be writing a a lot of proposals. Meanwhile, um, you know, trying to work on projects. So the usual kind of uh, small company thing, I guess, and big companies too. You know, you got to make five or ten proposals for one to come off, right? Yeah. Um, and it's good fun, kind of, you know, dreaming about what you could do with an idea or what you know, pitching things is is kind of fun. Um, but it's also kind of exhausting too. Um, what else? We, we we just announced that we're doing a course. We're doing a sort of two-day version of our beginner Python plus beginner machine learning course in Calgary, 5th and 6th of December. So uh, that'll be either Evan or I teaching that, probably. Um, and yeah, it's one of these ones that we put on on spec and then see kind of what happens. So if we get enough people sort of signed up, then it'll run. So I hope we do. So if you're in Calgary and you're listening and you want to come learn some Python and get started in machine learning, scikit-learn, um, yeah, sign up. It's uh, I guess if you go to agilescientific.com and look for the events, you'll find it there. Um, I've got a link in the show notes. or It's also on our Facebook page. I guess you can get to it through a Facebook event. Um, oh, and I was going to say, I, I do a sort of Christmas gift post at the end of November-ish beginning of December every year. So that's coming up. So I was just going to say, if anyone's got any awesome ideas for Chris, like geo slash tech Christmas gifts, especially geosciencey, geophysics, geology, Christmas gift ideas, I'd appreciate them because I've done, <laughs> this will be my probably sixth or seventh of these posts. Uh, you know, I'm not saying I'm running out of ideas, but uh, <laughs> it's always nice to have good <laughs> new input. <laughs> Last year we did an undersampled Christmas episode, which was amazing, and I look forward <laughs> to doing that again. Um, yeah, cool. There's some. There's like, if you are if if you are buying for a geoscientist uh, and you want some ideas, then look for like the gifts tag. I think on my blog and. The last posts have got some really cool stuff in them, right from like I don't know tea towels or, and things to uh, the coolest item on there. Well, there's two really awesome ones. One one was a glass three component seismometer made of glass um, that actually records X, Y, and Z 
uh, vibrations on traces of paper. And, oh, the other cool one was a Stegosaurus skull, which is still oh. for sale. Oh, sorry, not Stegosaurus, Triceratops. Not real. Uh, not... Still for sale. Yeah, real. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so it costs whatever it would cost to buy Haiti or something? I, no, it's actually quite reasonable. Like, I think it's $70,000. Oh, so. that's way cheaper than I would have thought. Yeah. Cool. It's, it's, it's a nice one. It's... So, uh, I wanted to introduce our guest today, who's Ted Petru. Ted, thanks for joining us. Ted's mute. Oh, he's on mute. He's on mute. He's on mute. Yeah. So while he turns off mute, I will say that Ted is the author of a book which I think just came out, which is the Pandas Cookbook. If you if you don't use Pandas, it's a Python library for doing um, data sciencey things. Yeah, it's not a cookbook with actual pandas, which is probably illegal, I think. Thank you for that. Um, he is the owner of Dunder Data, and he is the head of Houston Data Science. So uh, welcome, Ted. Are you joining us from Houston today? <laughs> no. No, I'm in, uh, I'm in Toronto. Sorry, I was having some connection problems. I, I might have to move. Um, but yeah, I, I just moved uh, all the way to Toronto, Ontario. Oh, wow. Nice. Welcome to Canada. Yeah. Uh, are, are, you not, are you Canadian? Or is this your no, my, my wife is Canadian. OK. My, my two kids are uh, Canadian because um, my wife filled out the paperwork. <laughs> for now. Nice. So Very what are you cool. doing? I was just in time for winter. Lucky you. Yeah, I've actually I've never experienced like a true winter before. I, you know, <laughs> you're gonna die. <laughs> you're gonna die. <laughs> I've gone to cold places before for um, a few days at a time, but that's it. Any suggestions, Matt, for braving the winter months <laughs> in Canada? I mean, what can you do? You just gotta Build grit your teeth, haven't you? So I, I, I guess my one tip is. If you ever leave your house on a really cold day and you've forgotten your hat or gloves and you think to yourself, I'll probably be okay. I'm only going 20 minutes down the street or something. Go back. Go get your hat and your gloves. <laughs> Unless you like frostbite. <laughs> Don't be a silly sausage. <laughs> That's actually good advice. <laughs> I was uh, I'm excited because my new office has a parking garage, which means I can keep the top off of my Jeep full time. And it just so happened that it was cold and raining here today, so uh, I was I did not have my hat or my gloves. Uh, so right. that's very cool. <laughs> I bet you were. <laughs> hey, what are you What are you doing in Canada? Are you still Do you still own Dunder Data? Yeah, I still. Yeah, that's still me. Cool. Uh, that's uh, my fledgling business. Um, yeah, I started it, I guess, more or less officially when I when I um, quit my job as a data scientist at Schlumberger in uh, April of uh, this year, 2017. So I'm doing it uh, full time um, and uh, just investing time in it right now. Yeah, of course. What, what, yeah, right. what is Dunder Data? What do you do? So, uh, Dunder Data is um, is a professional training, you know, service. I also do classes to the public, hmm. uh, primarily focused on, you know, data exploration, um, you know, entry level data science stuff. Um, so it targets, uh, it's it will be targeting, I should say, you know, corporate clients. Um, it. Uh, Primarily, uh, right now, focuses on just the public. Mm -hmm. So, and that's what I've done for the last, I don't know, since April of last year. So, about a year and a half, I've been doing uh, public classes. Um, started out as weekend classes on doing just basic data analysis with pandas. And then it uh, grew into, uh, I had enough material to have a week-long boot camp. And so, that's that's my primary class that I've been doing at the moment is uh, this week-long boot camp. That's awesome. Um, 
it's a, it's a general public. I mean, do you find that there's a lot of programming or uh, people with programming experience that sign up for the course? Uh, so there's there's no real prerequisites for my course. Okay. Um, oh, wow, that's cool. It definitely helps to have a programming background. Um, I give a, uh, a like pre-course assignment that I you know really try to force people to complete before you know taking my course. Um, that's a good and, idea. What is what uh, is that? Work out. Um, it's basic Python. So I may I, I you know I try to ensure that people have the fundamentals of Python down. I found so what I try to do is I I meet actually one time a week before the class, you know, get the programming environment set up because that's always um, a big headache, um, especially with people installing multiple versions of Python, different distributions. Uh, Windows people have problems with their path and and so forth, and mm -hmm. you know, anybody can have that problem. But uh, so anyways, I I get that started. Um, and uh, you know, I have a, my 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 courses are based on you know uh, lots of short problems um, of practice and um, lots of hands-on practice, and I give modeled solutions to everything. Um, so once once they've completed that and have the you know the uh, you know the, their system kind of set up, their environment set up, um, they're they're ready to start the course. And I'll even do some basic uh, introductory introduction to NumPy and, and pandas hmm. in the pre-course assignment. So it, it's a it's a long pre-course assignment. It should it takes like thirty or forty hours to complete. Um, okay. if you are going to do it properly. So, and there you know th th this is all built up from experience. So to, to get the most out of the course, and I want people to focus on actual data exploration, data analysis, and not on the you know building blocks of you know Python. Um, so I've tried to put a lot of stuff in the pre-course and uh, have, um, you know, basically just force people to, to, to get it done so we can all, you know, um, hit the ground running on that first day. It's not a lot of time. It's only five days, and there's only so much you can cover in, in five days. So I actually try to not cover too much, um, but enough where they, you should hopefully feel comfortable exploring any data set. I don't do any machine learning in this course, so it's purely... Uh, data exploration, and it's uh, primarily taught through the you know the pandas library of Python. Yeah, right. And there's a an accompanying book. You're you're the author of a book called the Pandas Cookbook, right? Right. So yeah, that's uh, I, that was just released uh, this last couple of weeks, and it's based off of uh, the course that I teach. So the the boot camp that I teach, and that is you know I had. Already several hundred pages of material on GitHub. So all my materials on GitHub, um, I have about 200 to 300 different like short answer problems. I have a few projects, you know. Uh, so it's it's all built up based off of that. Um, I get a lot of feedback from my courses. Um, so I already had a kind of a a book ready to go. Almost, um, I had to kind of tweak things. Ted, Gradually I, just sort of yeah, <laughs> petering uh, out. Ted, if you can still hear us, we need you to uh, move to that higher bandwidth connection spot you were just talking about. <laughs> um, in the meantime, we will go back to a bullet point that I missed on the top of the notes there, which is Matt's mention of 280 Twitter characters. What's that about? <laughs> well, if if you're on Twitter, I'm sure you've already found this out. But yeah, the um, I guess Twitter's been experimenting for the last few weeks with having a few users able to post 280 characters, which is twice the old limit, the limit they started with. And um, that yesterday they announced that um, sure enough they're going to roll it, or they have rolled it out now, I think, to all the all their users. They said almost all. I'm not totally sure what that means. Um, if maybe they've kept the limit for some bots, perhaps known bots, I should say. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, so you know, for me that was switched on when I got up this morning. Uh, it, it rolled over to the new thing, and you know, I, I I've used it already. Uh, I guess I don't 
tend to get overexcited about these changes to Twitter. Some people get totally freaked out by it. And this one, I guess, was a big deal because it, the, the 140 characters was so... One of their founding tenants. Yeah, it was like part of their DNA. Um, so I guess they would say they're evolving. <laughs> their DNA is changing. Um, they'd already made a bunch of changes, like, um, for instance, links to images weren't counted anymore. Um, the, they changed the way that you do at replies. They changed favorites into likes and stuff like that. So it's just a continuing sort of saga, I guess. But I must say, uh, it's not a sad, like some, there is something about you, there's more noticeably more scrolling now, I guess. Mm. Get down your timeline, especially because some, you know, uh, <laughs> because of the novelties that some people are involved in tomfoolery with just making extremely long characters or uh, posts. I don't know if you saw this, but some someone the other day had figured out how to post a single tweet anyway with thirty five thousand characters. Huh? Yeah, they found some weird Twitter loophole huh. that allowed them to. Apparently, Twitter was interpreting these thirty five thousand characters as a link. I think. And um, somehow was fooling it. They didn't. They weren't meaningful. It wasn't a novel or anything. It was just a bunch of gobbledygook. But um, it it broke Twitter for a while, and he's now been banned. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it looks like Ted is back, and uh, I wanted to I actually. This is a good segue. <laughs> we can just edit this in as a segue. Uh, I wanted to bring up a question that came up today on our little Slack instance. Matt, do you want to pose the question to Ted? We're going to, oh, we're yeah. going to challenge your pandas knowledge here, Ted. Yeah, <laughs> and my memory. Um, yeah, well, I guess uh, someone was asking about the, the someone was saying, hey, uh, dot lock or I lock, I can't remember which one he was using, was, was, was there anything faster than that? And I guess. Um, there was a suggestion to use dot index or ix, and um, and then someone was timing them and saying actually dot locks faster. And then I think someone said, well, dot ix is deprecated. Um, and then and then I I searched on the interwebs and found an answer you'd written, Ted, on <laughs> Stack Stack Overflow like only a couple of weeks ago, I think. Um, that was pretty comprehensive. Is is that the kind of thing that you kind of really delve into? Uh, you, you you must quite enjoy exploring some of that. That Stack Overflow answer is epic. Uh, yeah, no, I'm a I'm a huge proponent of you know learning through Stack Overflow actually. Hmm. And uh, actually, before I had ever you know uh, created my course on pandas, I never I'd only been. Um, you know, an onlooker on Stack Overflow. I wasn't an actual contributor, hmm. uh, so I would just, you know, you know, do what everybody else did and, and copy and paste um, solutions into their own code. And I found that actually, um, I learned um, pandas the best by actually, you know, answering questions. And I thought I found out that that was actually the best way to hmm. learn. And then now I have this sort of. Uh, Corollary to that is that you don't. I, I don't believe you, know, you don't really know a Python library unless you can actually um, answer a majority of the questions on Stack Overflow. On it. And if you if you have trouble answering the questions, and you, you really, um, I mean, you know that that's this is sort of a generalization. It's you know so not to, in the whole true all cases, but I, I think it's actually a. A fairly valid statement most of the time is that if you can't answer Stack Overflow questions on a Python library, then you don't know it uh, as well as you think you do. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so yeah, getting back to um, indexing. Um, so pandas in its early days um, used um, this indexer. So index when I talk when I say indexing, I, it basically just means selecting uh, elements out of a you know, out of the data frame, which is the main, um, you know, data structure in pandas that holds the data. So um, uh, that IX was used to simultaneously select rows and columns um, in a data frame. Um, and in pandas, there's 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 two uh, separate ways you can select data from a data frame. 
And one is based on the inter integer location of the row or column. And the other is based on the label of the row or column. Mm -hmm. So this is actually a source of massive confusion for <laughs> Pandas users. This dual sort of um, ability to, uh, uh, this dual index for each row and column. So each row and each column has an integer location and it has a label. Um, so um, yeah, so this confuses users all the time. And .ix um, was actually uh, uh, also very confusing because it could, it could take either integers or labels. Oh, right. Uh, so it was actually ambiguous. And uh, Pandas developers added .ilog for purely integer location. And integer location, um, just for people who don't know, it's, it's very simple. It's based on exactly how you would select items in a list in Python. So uh, the element, so zero stands for the first element, and uh, it just counts upwards until n minus one. Um, and label location is just is based on exactly how uh, Python dictionaries, how you select elements out of a Python dictionary. You pass it the label, the key, and you get back the value. So Pandas has this dual list slash dictionary uh, lookup. Um, but then that .ix just confused so many people that they, yeah, they brought in .ilog for integer location only and .loc, L-O-C, for a label location. And um, that is um, explicit and not ambiguous whatsoever. Um, now, regarding which one is faster, um, there's very few use cases, I think, that would you know, necessitate uh, trying to speed up um, lookups. Um, so that's, that's generally not the, the primary focus. If you are really interested in lookups, you would use your drop down into NumPy and get much faster um, you know, uh, lookups of your values that you needed. So you can, ex you can, you can mm -hmm. uh, take the data from a pandas data frame and uh, you know, get the underlying NumPy array, which it is based upon, and then make your selection that way if you absolutely um, needed the, the, the best performance. Um, so IX has actually been deprecated. And so you'll see on Stack Overflow, I usually say never use I, dot IX. And I've, I've, I've looked, so re, this is just recently. I just spent the last, very recently, the last week and a half or so just going through stack, old Stack Overflow questions and updating answers. So hmm. Pandas is a, is, has, uh, progressed a lot since a lot of the so the, a lot of the earlier answers in 2012 and 2013 have a l the mo the highest number of upvotes, and mm -hmm. some of them have been seen like several hundred thousand page views. You can see the page views on on the top right hand corner in Stack Stack Overflow. Yeah, there's some very bad answers that are that are like ranked you know that are selected and have you know many upvotes. So yeah, I, I took it upon myself to actually go back and. Um, answer a lot of these questions properly and give very thorough answers. So that that's that was one of them. So if you look back at the top, you know, uh, approximately 200 highest upvoted pandas answers, um, I don't know, maybe 10 to 15 percent of them or more, maybe now, uh, you'll see an answer from me. Um, right. When I saw that, uh, I I didn't you know, I, I didn't really think the top answer was was good or it was outdated. Yeah. I provided my own. And uh, so, you know, I obviously do that to promote myself too, since I get a lot of page views. Yeah, right. I mean, um, it is definitely a weakness, isn't it, of Stack Overflow that, that the libraries are changing and the answers are becoming obsolete, but there's not really a good way of knowing if you're looking at something which is, which is obsolete or not. Um, because yeah. no one's ever going to go in and like, Select. A, I, I, I. It's hard to imagine some the, the person who asked the question going back to change the preferred answer. Do you know what I mean? I just can't see that happening. And you could yeah. go and edit the accepted answers, but that always feels a bit funny to me because the answer was accepted in its state. But if you've got enough rep, you can edit answers, and then you don't get any kudos for it, right? You don't get any upvotes. So, right. So yeah, yeah, adding another answer to something where the accepted answers got like five hundred upvotes feels a bit like a. 
a little no, whisper so, in the wind. Yeah, so it just takes time, and uh, so this was like a, a long-term investment, I think, for myself. <laughs> So I think slowly, so yeah, so if you're coming to Stack Overflow and you see my answer, it has two upvotes uh, versus 500, you know, you're, you're definitely not going to, uh, for the majority of the people, you're not going to uh, take it into consideration. You're going to immediately dismiss it. Um, but, you know, over time, there'll be experts that visit and, um, yeah. you know, slowly the upvotes will continue, um, will, will continue. And, um you know, things can change slowly. So it's a, yeah, like I said, it's a long-term investment. And a few of the people have actually changed their um, accepted answers to mine. Okay. Uh, That's cool. uh, yeah, it has, uh, it has benefited me directly. And um, it would be kind of neat if you could, as a user, like, I guess I can understand that Stack Overflow might not want to change their algorithm too drastically, you know, uh, in, in now, but, it would be kind of cool if, as a user, you could say, I'd like to see the upvotes weighted by recency um, or weighted by like the even the rep of the person who gave the upvote. Right. right? So if someone with high rep upvotes something, I'd rather give that more weight. Um, it would be kind of neat if they let users actually play with that weighting themselves. Don't, I, I guess caching all of that would be important. Well, you couldn't cache it because it'd be different for everybody no yeah you, yeah you could cache it you could cache it because it'd be this it'd be, it'd be constant for each actual post they should do that <laughs> yeah i think you know they, they keep things fairly simple um mm -hmm. and i think they've, they've pretty much kept i think i mean I, I i'm not sure because i've only been you know a, a main user for about a year now um i think the rules have basically remained constant for yeah and, well if you go look at meta which is where they discuss the stuff right. about Stack Overflow. <laughs> I mean, every single tiny change to the algorithm and, and the user interface gets discussed. It's kind of like Wikipedia. It, it, everything descends into this right. spiral of <laughs> detail. It's kind of, it's kind of lame. But, um, but yeah, it's an awesome site. Like, I don't know where we'd be without it. Yeah. So you know, it's it's sort of this interesting. Uh, you know, uh, it, it, I don't know. I think this is. I mean, I, I like Stack Overflow a lot. I use it all the time. But you know, what would if we just didn't have access to the stuff? We'd be forced to like read documentation, right? Oh. And we might have, I don't. Know, I don't know if we'd actually learn better fundamentals just by forcing ourselves to read through. Um, you know the the, the the you know the the details of the documentation. Or mm -hmm. actually read books, you know, mm -hmm. um, instead of you know taking the easy path. And you know, because I I've read through the pandas documentation myself, like I don't know, at least half a dozen times, like, like all the way through, um, and all the way through before boot camp, just to you know really refresh myself. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and it's a lot. There's like a thousand pages, or there, there's like fifteen hundred yeah. pages. It's an enormous amount of stuff. It's code, so it, you know it goes by fast. Not a lot of output. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if if it would be good to, you know, temporarily block yourself from Stack Overflow. You can actually, you know, it's probably a good mix. Is is is, is nice. Yeah. Uh, that's yeah. that's the kind of strategy that I would probably say is for people. So how did you wind up giving all these Stack Overflow answers? I mean, give us a little background, a story of your career or whatever. Uh, you know, it's, it's it's from your website. We can see you've worked in a bunch of different verticals, like financial, biz, education, oil and gas, poker. Right. Give us give us, give us the, the thread. Uh, sure. So, yeah, in, uh, when I was an undergrad, I uh, went to Texas A&M. Uh, you know, like most people didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. I, I was very good at um, basic math. Um, I didn't know what actual math was. I thought it was, you know, taking uh, calculus AP exams, which were like incredible <laughs> because, you know, you could just study the old tests and basically, uh, you know, memorize how to do problems. I didn't realize uh, actual math involves something called proofs. You know, and this was, I, I learned this out the hard way and when I took uh, 
I took an advanced calculus class in college. I was like, all right, advanced. I did great in calculus. I'm going to nail this. And then uh, my first homework assignment, uh, I think I got some uh, notes that said, you can't actually use calculus on this assignment. You know, you have to scratch. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I actually dropped that class. <laughs> and uh, was, uh, you know, a little shaken up that I didn't actually, I wasn't actually as good at math as I thought I was. So um, I found out about actuarial science, which was, as close to AP calculus as you could get. And uh, for those who don't know what actuarial science is, it's, it's sort of the um, statisticians behind a lot of the insurance business. Um, so you're the second uh, data science interested person that wanted to be an actuary we've had on the show, by the way. Oh, OK. Just noting that. Anyway, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. no, it's a, it's a very, uh, back then, you know, it was a, it, so for me, it really interested me because I, I actually like the exam format. You took 10 exams, and you were handed a pile of cash. And there was a straight <laughs> path you could take to, like, you know, going around the board and collecting your money, right? It was just like Monopoly. It was extremely straightforward, too many questions about it. And um, at least the preliminary exams were very just pure um, uh, computation-based, no theory, um, right up my alley. I've always liked these little tricky little probability problems, and so it was fun for me. I enjoyed I enjoyed doing that stuff. I actually want to be an actuary. I think I, I just like the exam process, um, and so I, I actually decided to go to grad school um, in statistics at Rice University. I uh, entered their PhD program, and uh, was uh, unloaded with proof-based classes in uh, deep probability theory. And um, that was in 2004. And poker had just exploded. The online poker boom had just happened in 2003 when a man named Chris Moneymaker won the World Series. And ESPN started televising poker and showing hold cards. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I just, so it coincided with my beginning of grad school. Um, which, uh, in retrospect, not to be really good, it, it prevented me from getting a PhD. A lot of doors for me, I think, um, in the process. So I, I essentially dropped out of my PhD program. I, I was awarded a master's degree, had an extremely low uh, GPA, um, but had enough credits to, you know, to earn the degree. So now I can probably say I have a, I have a master's degree in statistics. <laughs> instead of a failed PhD with nothing. <laughs> uh, so um, I, I did take a few more actuarial, a couple more actuarial exams at uh, my uh, graduate school career. And I was very well qualified to be an actuary. And I tried uh, pretty hard to get, in, uh, to, to get a job. I, was, um, uh, I had more exams than like 90% candidates I had a master's degree um, you know and, but I just wasn't able to get a job I don't I don't know uh, or yeah, I wasn't able to secure a job um, and uh, actually so and I was playing poker a lot and I was starting to do well and I decided to just play poker full-time um, on 2006-2007 and that's back when the games and you might, you might not be familiar with online poker, but uh, um, the games were, uh, what's called, were fairly soft uh, back then. A lot of, there wasn't as much information, not nearly as much information uh, available um, as there is now. So to, so to compare the poker boom to data science, it would be like <laughs> becoming a data science expert in 2012, um, you know, as like playing poker is in 2006. So, you know, basically I was, I was in a really good spot to um, exploit people who were not uh, that good at poker. Yeah. And, you know, the game is all about exploiting other people's strategies uh, to maximize your own, you know, uh, you know, your own tick. Um, so I, I, so I did that and uh, I ended up uh, playing majority of my, 
poker career was played one on one, so it's called Heads Up. Um, and I found this was my best opportunity to, to target weaker players. Um, because in poker, you know, if you're playing at a 10 handed game and uh, maybe there's five bad players and there's five good players, well, the, uh, or, you know, maybe there's only two bad players. Um, um, in the long run, theoretically, the bad players' money will funnel into all the good players, you know, um, after all the variance has kind of taken its toll. Um, so I wanted to extract as much money as possible, so I tried to uh, find bad players and play them as many hands as I could heads up. So uh, that was my strategy, um, and it worked for a while, but uh, uh, poker is a very emotionally tough game for me, and um, uh, this is going to be a, would be a very long talk to talk about all the uh, all the hardship that poker <laughs> brought on. But uh, suffice it to say, I'm, I'm very glad I, I ended up uh, stopping uh, my poker playing. Uh, it's going a little bit crazy. Um, <laughs> in, uh, in 2009, uh, I was, it afforded me a lot of you know, time to travel and um, you know, have fun. But, but you know, in the end, it was just poker. And it was you know, the same thing over and over every day. I probably played about a million hands of so poker. Five years? It was five years ago? Uh, yeah, I played five years, yeah. yeah. I think I deposited my first amount of money in February of 2014. I played till like November of 2009. So, <laughs> um, it was, it was, it was great. Poker was, probably the, I, I probably learned the most, I'm very, very thankful for poker. And I think it's, um, a lot of poker players have now turned into data scientists. And there's a lot of very good. Uh, How did that evolution happen for you? Excuse me. How did that evolution happen for you? So for me personally, so I I but basically just crashed and burned uh, playing poker. I was uh, you know staying up very long hours of the night. You know, as uh, some nights I wouldn't sleep. I would play like twelve hours straight. You know, I've extraordinarily. I didn't like losing. Uh, very competitive. Um, so, the, 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 you know, when you play poker, you need to be completely detached from your emotions. You need to be a machine. You know, you cannot let your emotions dictate anything. You need to be focused, you know, on the strategy, on exploiting, on understanding, you know, when you're tired or hungry or need a break. You know, these are the most important qualities um, once you have the fundamentals of the game down. Um, because if you can't, you know, uh, keep your mind in the right place, then, then it's not going to work out. So I, I wasn't able to mentally, uh, you know, uh, overcome this. And it was, uh, you know, it was a very difficult time for me. So it was, uh, um, especially towards the end. So it, it, uh, it ended and I, uh, I ended up, uh, um, you know, I was, I was very far removed. I never had a corporate job at this point. I was about 27 years old, 28 years old, never had a corporate job. And I decided to teach math. So I taught math for three and a half years. Um, and, uh, it like was a, high school? Yeah, so I, I taught high school math for three and a half years. Um, I tutored for one year, then I, I was a, uh, you know, a teacher for two years. Hmm. And that was, a, that was a, actually a, a very rewarding and uh, horrible experience at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> but very thankful for that. Um, I was... Uh, yeah, it was, it was, I was able to, you know, um, you know, I had to, had to be professional, finally. Um, even though I was a professional poker player, I was never a professional human, I think. So it forced me to be, uh, you know, a human professional and, uh, you know, earn respect of others. And that was very difficult in the high school that I taught. And the first year did not go so well for me, but the second year was, was a lot better. Um, and in the second year, that was, it was, uh, Two thousand. By that time, it was uh, two thousand thirteen, um, and uh, data science had started becoming popular. One of my friends, uh, very close friends, told me about uh, Coursera, right. and um, Coursera had just started the year before. And I found this uh, Python course. Um, I think a lot of people have taken from Rice University. You build like several little games. I don't. 
probably uh, changed significantly since the time I took it. It's like interactive programming in Python. Um, it was a fantastic course. I, uh, I, I liked it. Um, I had learned, I had done quite a bit of programming in college. You know, I have a, uh, and I did very well in those classes. We learned C and Java back then, so Python was uh, completely new to me. Um, but it, uh, that's what was, that, that's what was taught in Coursera was, was primarily Python. Um, a lot of introductory Python courses. Um, and then I took a data science course. Um, I think it was from the University of Washington in St. Louis by Bill Howe. And I only completed, I didn't have, I was teaching at the same time, so I didn't have time to complete it, but um, just taking that course motivated me to, um, you know, uh, use my math skills uh, in the corporate world. Uh, other than teaching, so I was teaching math, and, and I and I had this itch to actually do math, and so the trouble was trying to get a job again. And uh, luckily, I found a very good uh, entry level like data analyst job at a uh, corporation called Kelsey Siebold. They're a large medical group in Houston that's similar to Kaiser Permanente uh, if you're on the West Coast. Um, uh, so they're sort of Houston's version of Kaiser Permanente, and um, they had a lot of data. And I was just a, an analyst, but I was given access to SQL, and uh, I just ran with it. I loved SQL. I loved being able to program. I, uh, my dashboarding tool was Excel. I programmed, I automated a lot of tasks with uh, Excel VBA. And it was sort of like this, this perfect entryway into data. I, you know, as a statistics uh, major, you know, in, a grad, in my graduate program, you're not exposed to data. So I was not exposed to data, I should say. You know, I, I was exposed to numbers in theory. Right. And, you know, I, I had no idea what a database was. I had no idea what a relational database was. I didn't know how data was stored in the real world. Um, I had no idea there was this thing called SQL that, like, almost everybody uses. Um, you know, I was just used to having a CSV file and getting my data, and we used R in my stats program, uh, and this was back when R wasn't as nearly as popular, back in 2004, 2005, um, and you know, running regressions in R or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, um, so to me, like it just this whole new world opened up, and I and I and I was just so <laughs> in shock that this existed, and uh, it it seemed so. It actually seemed very sad that I wasn't exposed to this this earlier. Um, because I was very interested in um, you know, this query tool called SQL. So, um, but you know, Kelsey Siebel didn't have any data scientists back then. Um, they were running, you know, just basic business analytics. Um, I put together a lot of fun, you know, reports. Um, you know, like searching for surgeries from certain physicians that might have, you know, cost too much or what whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so there's a lot of fun things you can do with SQL that doesn't involve any data science whatsoever. Um, and uh, so at that point, I I, uh, I wanted to I wanted to become a data scientist. Data science had become very popular. I found out about uh, online or not in person boot camps like coding camps, and I felt like I needed I felt like I needed one of these to kind of propel me to the next level. And there were there's one that had just started up called Zipian Academy. In, in 2013, and so I uh, I applied and uh, took their interview and, and got in and um, and for you know I felt like I, I wasn't equipped enough to kind of go get a job as a data scientist myself, um, and I really just wanted to dedicate myself to data science, you know, without any distractions. Uh, so <laughs> my family's not here, so. Uh, that's what I'm talking about, but uh, I needed some time alone. <laughs> we'll see this later. I just needed some time alone to um, just to focus on learning and focus on myself. And I kind of missed the university environment. I missed you know being around students and uh, other classmates. So I, I did it. It was expensive, and um, uh, the I would say the the best experience was just uh, the other people in the class and just having the dedicated time. I think the instructor quality could have definitely been much higher, but uh, the overall experience was still very good, very fun. There was 
there was enough good assignments and enough uh, you know smart people in the same room to make it to make it worthwhile. Did they have a recruiting effort at the end of the boot camp to help you get a job? They do, yeah. They they had one. Um, they were they were bought out by a company called Galvanize, yep. um, which uh, is much more popular now. And I think they still use the same base curriculum for their data science stuff. I know we have a couple of uh, listeners was, who are interested in, in attending one of these boot camps. It was, so you said it was expensive. Was it, did it turn out to be worth it? Yeah, it definitely turned out to be worth it. I got a job um, actually almost immediately after in Houston, uh -huh. um, in a city that had very few data science openings. In fact, I only applied to one data science position. That's the only one I found. And I actually applied directly to the vice president uh, on LinkedIn. And I was hired almost immediately. And it was that at Schlumberger? That was at Schlumberger, yeah. So I'd actually worked at Schlumberger as an intern back as a graduate student for a semester huh. um, and did some stuff in R for them. And uh, so it was kind of a, a cool, uh, I don't know, circled back in, to, my, to my roots of 10 years ago. So I, I was awesome. in, it was the summer of 2005 that I was, uh, worked at Schlumberger, and then I, I got hired in January 2015 hmm. um, as a data scientist, um, making just a little bit more than I did as an intern, but it was okay. You know, I, was, <laughs> I was just, I was happy to have the opportunity. I, I, you know, I'd finally gotten, I think, uh, you know, I'd gotten a position that I think I was um, sort of like meant to be in, I guess, um, you know, having a statistics degree, I think it was very well suited for me. Um, yeah, well, they kind of hired many people in 2015. You might have been the only one. <laughs> yeah, so we had, so our, our group group. I was the first data scientist hired on the team. So we the slumber wow. it, it all kind of worked out. Uh, I got very lucky. Um, I was the first data scientist hired. My boss was hired only three weeks before me, and his boss, the VP, was only hired like a month before that. So it was a brand new department, and we hired many people very quickly. Does it still um, exist? Does the department? It's so. <laughs> It, uh, it had a very tumultuous uh, uh, run uh, about a year later. Um, so I think a lot of it had to do with the drop in oil prices. So uh, oil was, I think it peaked in 2014 at like 100 and something a barrel, 110. And it, it nosedived into the beginning of 2015. But there was already a lot of uh, and a lot of money already kind of advanced analytics uh, department at Schlumberger. So um, we hired through that downturn, um, and other groups were laying off people, um, and we were growing. So we, we grew fast, um, but, uh, but you know, about six months later, ten months later, everything stopped. I actually interviewed like 30 people. Um, mm -hmm. When I when I when I got there, um, you know, we, we bought on an intern. Um, it was it was it was an overall very good experience. Uh, the I would say the first year was a very good experience, and then, um, you know, we had some issues with leadership, and I think the the oil downturn really affected things. We stopped hiring, yeah, of course. and then people started leaving because um, that's what you know, this is a new industry. It's very hot, so anybody with data science experience, you know, sure. was was just taken off. You know, very quickly. So, the almost everybody, the original, you know, ten to twelve people who were hired. I don't think anybody's left uh, at Schlumberger. So, there might be one. I think there's one guy that I interviewed that we hired a few months after I did. I and I haven't checked if he's still there, but um, out of like between ten and fifteen people, there's 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 very few people left. Maybe just one or two people. So. And thus, Dunder Data exists. My boss has got so um, it, it's just a combination of uh, you know uh, not hiring and then other people paying more. Um, work and uh, so the the talent just left, yeah. um, and I finally left myself. Um, uh, six months ago.
Yeah, so you, you wrote the book over the summer kind of thing? I, like, I wouldn't mind knowing a bit about how, how the book came about and what kind of... Uh, yeah. I, I, I feel like this week, or like the last two weeks, I've heard about several books from Pact Publishing, and I wasn't really aware of Pact oh, before. Okay. So uh, what, what, who, who are they and how, where did that relationship come from and uh, how did the book come about? Uh-oh. I think uh, we... Oh. <laughs> Did you catch my question, Ted? Yeah, I got it. I got it. Okay. So okay. Uh, just to go back a little bit, so I, the idea for doing professional training came about when I had training myself. Uh, so our company, like I said, we were uh, heavily, you know, invested into analytics and our, you know, our, my boss um, got us many... <laughs> Uh, we had I had four weeks of professional training at Schlumberger. Huh. This is like full on all day long professional training. We had like a week from Hortonworks, um, more than a week, like two weeks from Hortonworks, uh, a week from SAS, and a week of Python training. And I thought all the training was was uh, particularly poor, uh, <laughs> and it was very very expensive. So I found out how much it cost, and I was. And I was like, oh, my, my entire paycheck is uh, in like uh, two weeks here um, of technical training. And I was like, hey, I could, I could definitely do this. I've been a teacher before. Yeah. I have uh, basic uh, teaching skills. Um, and, uh, and uh, yeah, so I, I, I want – and I could do it – yeah, I just thought I could do it better. So I started – this yeah, April 2016, I held my first class. Um, and I held, I just held it for free, a full day class on just basic, uh, yeah, data exploration and, um, slowly started building material until I had enough for a week. And I, like I already explained this. Um, so I just kept on adding solely material, uh, over time. And, uh, when I had, and I couldn't take off any more vacation to do boot camps, then I, then I quit to do to do Dunder Data full time because I couldn't uh, I couldn't work fifty two weeks in a year, yeah. uh, and also do you know more than like two boot camps without uh, probably dying. So, um, and I uh, uh, yeah. So it, it's just something I've wanted to do. I've wanted to work on my own, and it kind of uh, you know kind of worked out that I was shown how corporate training is and and uh, how I can improve it. Um, so I teach a very drastically different style than it was than the, the corporate training I received. So uh, the basically the corporate training I received was you know more like just going to a circus and watching a show. Like you, you saw someone who performed some entertainment and then and you went home. You didn't know how to actually do any of it. Okay. Um, so uh, the doing is actually the, the most important part. Lectures. Yeah. Well, yeah, just lectures and just watching. Um, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, my class is, is a very hands-on. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I so yeah, th then the, I contacted Pact Publishing in uh, I don't know December or January, so December two thousand sixteen, and uh, pitched some idea. Um, I I bought many books from Pact myself. Um, they're a large publishing company in India. Um, you can uh, you know, feel free to read about what other people say about them. Um, they do have uh, a large collection of very uh, – so they, they tend to publish on very particular topics, hmm. very technical topics, So, um, which other publishing companies might not. So if you want a very you know, uh, obscure technical topic – um, that you're interested in, you can you can almost surely find it unpacked. I mean, I think they they boast about having more than 3,500 authors. So, um, uh, so yeah, if, yeah. So they, they have a large selection of books. Yeah. Well, and we uh, I sent them. Sorry, go ahead. No, I, I just sent them a proposal. And they said they had this uh, opening for Panda's cookbook. That was something in their line. And uh, then I also sent O'Reilly, which is a um, you know a, a much bigger player in the space. 
they produce much fewer books. Um, but uh, O'Reilly offered me a like a teaching, like a three-day teaching course, um, which I, I wanted to write a book and um, sort of uh, just something fun and cool to do, actually, some sort of lifelong little project I wanted to do. So um, I went with Pact and uh, submitted a proposal to finish the book in June and uh, didn't get done until October. So it, uh, it took, uh, and this was after I already had, like I said, a large bulk of the material already written, um, you know, from my, from my course. But, uh, of course, you know, translating that into a book is in, into their format is a completely different thing. Yeah. So, you know, slowly by slowly, and I was working too. So most of the book was actually completed in the, the last three months of the project. So when I finally was able to take time off and, um, you know, concentrate on, so I basically just did nothing but write uh, the book for three months Wow. Um, to get it done. So I'd only written maybe 30% of the book before that. And then I wrote the rest, the seven, you know, the other 70% uh, during those three months. Right. Nice. We, have a, we have a link on our show notes to the Amazon uh, version of where you can buy the pandas cookbook by Ted and we encourage listeners to go do that um, but uh, unfortunately we're, we're about to run out of time but before we go we how do we how do listeners um, get in touch about taking a course with I, 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 I didn't hear that how, how do interested people get in touch with you to take a course with Dunder data Okay, so uh, since I just moved to Canada, um, you'd have to come to Toronto for my in-person courses. Okay. Um, I am, uh, um, so I am, I should uh, promote myself a little bit, I am speaking at the Pi Data NYC conference in a few weeks um, on November, it's November 27th through 30th. Hmm. Um, I'm giving a tutorial on idiomatic pandas. Cool. Just means, the correct way to write pandas code, and yeah. uh, which we find out there's lots of uh, lots of bad ways to write pandas, and it's uh, very evident on Stack Overflow if you look at the incoming questions how horrible they are. Um, no fault of their own. It's just uh, it takes a while to to really master it. Um, so I, I haven't launched any online courses yet. Um, I did put out a an offer to give everyone a thirty minute tutorial who purchased my book on a certain day. Um, I might uh, do that again, but um, if you're uh, if you're interested, you'll you're going to have to basically wait. I'm still in the process of uh, building some um, remote classes. Um, cool. So um, and I might come back to Houston and do a boot camp, something like that. Um, every once in a while, um, but for now I'm still in. I'm in the. Um, I guess I, I'm not a startup, so I shouldn't say this, but I'm in the incubation stage <laughs> <laughs> uh, of myself, just um, building out uh, the business. So the first step was writing the book. I, um, do a lot of promotions. I'm actually going to write a, a extremely long uh, review of. Um, the the other book that came out at the exact same time as mine called uh, Python for Data Analysis. Right. So um, that that'll be out probably on Monday. Your fifty page review on that, a uh, line by line review. Wow. So. Uh, so yeah, you'll you'll hopefully be seeing a lot of me uh, online, and I'll be posting a lot of other uh, blog posts, like on how to get started with pandas. How to do? Uh, how, because a lot of people want to know how to learn it, and I, I I'm going to give step by step instructions on how to, um, you know, get deep into the library and, and and master it. Cool. Well, we look forward to the review, and we hope our listeners uh, come come look you up. Definitely check out the show notes if you're listening to the show. There's a ton of good stuff linked in there. Um, you could spend hours going through all of Ted's stuff. <laughs> Ted, thanks for joining us on the show. Yeah, thanks, Graham, and uh, thanks, Matt, for, for having me. I really enjoyed being here. Awesome, yeah, thanks a lot. 
audience, we'll see you next week on Undersampled Radio, episode 64. Another power of two. No, it's not the right index. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>